Welcome to part one of the counter movement jump. Today, we're going to be focused on force and jump height, as well as key metrics to review after completing this test with your athletes. Research has shown that the counter movement jump is the most common neuromuscular and physical performance test in the world. Primarily, it's a quick and easy assessment of the lower limbs that has physiological relevance to almost all sports and provides several insights into your athlete's foundational movement. Force, in relative terms, is an influence that can change the motion of an object. Producing force is the definitive goal of the musculoskeletal system. By examining the application of force over time in a movement, an exercise professional can gain vital insight into an athlete's physical capabilities, fatigue levels, contributing factors to injuries, and their ability to play their sport. Although CMJ testing provides many wonderful metrics, it can be easy to get lost in the noise. That's why it's important to understand what you're looking for. This is often achieved by understanding key differences, such as those describing an athlete's general traits, like power, versus others that lend themselves better to rehabilitation progress, such as asymmetries for force and time. In terms of assessing an athlete's general physical abilities, it's important to remember the primary purpose of a jump and what determines this. Ultimately, we jump to measure jump height. There are several ways to determine jump height with the most prominent being jump height calculated via flight time, through contact with the plates, and based off the impulse momentum method. Flight time is a reliable method that requires stringent protocol and mathematical assumptions. The impulse momentum calculation uses factors which are directly measured in force and time to calculate center of mass change against gravity. The advantage of the latter is that it gives rise to other considerable metrics we can trust and use to understand our athletes. By tracking the jump height via the impulse momentum method, we can understand an athlete's ability to produce force quickly and to achieve athletic movement. It also gives context to the outcome of a jump. If an athlete moves quicker or has a better force production metric but doesn't result in a higher jump, this lets us know that their force output wasn't favorable in success of the task we're asking them to do. It can also help us understand if an athlete gave their best effort, which is required to make quality inferences. The aim of strength training is to improve application of force in both the size of the force applied and the speed of which it can be applied. Power is the measure of force applied in time and is a great measure for assessing this in an athlete. We can determine peak power in a CMJ very easily on force plates. This means that by monitoring power output in a CMJ, we can analyze if an athlete has the athletic traits we want and whether our program is eliciting the stimulus we need. Diving a little deeper, we can break power into two distinct factors in force and time. Understanding how our athletes generate power also provides great insight into how we can direct our programming to maximize an athlete's potential. Let's start by looking at force. The counter movement jump utilizes the stretch shortening cycle. So we get contribution from the eccentric and concentric actions of the musculoskeletal system. This is a great place to start to help us understand force production capabilities. Fortunately, in a CMJ, identifying these metrics is very easy. Force decks will identify eccentric peak force and takeoff peak force, which is concentric peak force. By inspecting the magnitude of both metrics, we can determine the contribution of the eccentric and concentric phases, giving potential direction to our programming. We aren't necessarily searching for parity between the two, but the greater the contribution from both, the better the outcome. The other side of the power equation is time for both the eccentric and concentric portions of the jump. For athletic performance, we generally want athletes to produce force quickly. So seeing an athlete with a high force but long contraction time isn't necessarily ideal. The time factor provides context to how the force was produced in both phases. So two key metrics to consider are eccentric duration and concentric duration. Similarly with peak force, we aren't necessarily looking for parity between the two, as they are controlled by different physiological mechanisms. Instead, we are looking to maximize the return of the elastic force produced in the counter movement in a very quick time. For example, the mean eccentric duration of NBA players is 520 milliseconds, with the top 25% of players under 450 milliseconds. The concentric duration will generally be shorter than the eccentric duration. With these four metrics in mind, we can now take this to a applied example. Let's hear from Sean Smith, a senior performance coach at the University of Louisville, who uses these metrics within his programming to maximize his athletes' performance outcomes.
Hi, my name is Sean Smith. I'm a senior performance coach at the University of Louisville working with our women's volleyball program. In this video, we'll take a look at how we've used force plate information to aid in training program design and give a bit of a case study example and talk about how that has helped strengthen the connection between training and on-court performance. A deeper dive in terms of force plate use is to individualize training intervention based on jump strategy and outcome measures. With our women's volleyball program here at the University of Louisville, after a round of testing in which we did counter movement jump testing and strength testing in the form of a squat, we found that our athletes that had a relative strength level of 1.75 times their body weight typically jumped higher, so we separated the team into an advanced or strong group and a developmental or weak group. With the advanced group, we took additional steps with our counter movement jump data to gain better understanding on how we can impact our athletes' jump performance and hopefully their on-court performance as well. We also took subjective feedback from the coaching staff into account. Regarding the subjective feedback from the coaching staff, we had one individual athlete in particular who the coaches wanted to get up faster or jump quicker when attacking. Using our data from the counter movement jump testing, we were able to identify and confirm that this athlete had the greatest counter movement depth on the team and the longest eccentric duration, meaning she was going lower and thus taking longer to jump. We had one other individual within the advanced group that had a similar jumping strategy, so we were able to further divide the advanced group, creating one subgroup focused on overall outputs and the other subgroup focused on improving the braking aspect, while also focused on altering counter movement depths during jumping activities. Both advanced subgroups were given programs designed with specific interventions in mind to focus on their individual needs. This can sometimes be daunting for practitioners to manage, with a large group of athletes and multiple programs being implemented at the same time. One strategy that we used when designing programs to make this feasible logistically was to utilize the same or very similar exercises while making alterations to the execution of or how the athlete is performing that exercise. For example, when programming a trap bar squat jump for the advanced groups, one subgroup may perform that exercise starting with the bar on the ground, fully resetting between each rep, emphasizing the concentric portion and using a slightly heavier load than the other subgroup. That other subgroup focused on the braking aspect may also be performing a trap bar squat jump in that session, although with different technique or execution. So rather than starting from the floor, they may start standing up or in a tall position, drop down using a very short, sharp, stiffer range of motion about a quarter of the way down, emphasizing the braking aspect of an overall speed of the movement, and they'd likely be using a lighter load relative to the other group. At the end of this phase of training, we conducted some post-testing and found that while all athletes in the advanced group improved in most outcome measures, such as jump height and relative peak power, the group emphasizing braking specifically had greater improvements in eccentric rate of force development, takeoff velocity, and both concentric and eccentric durations with minimal to no change in counter movement depth. Essentially, what post-testing showed was that while we didn't have large amounts of change in how low those athletes would go in their counter movement, they were able to complete the jump faster and jump higher. Additionally, regarding the specific athlete mentioned earlier who the coaches wanted to jump quicker, the coaches were able to provide more subjective feedback stating that the athletes seemed to be getting up faster, get to more balls and make better contact as well as be able to drive harder when attacking. Having a piece of technology such as Forstex has been instrumental in our holistic player development process as we've been able to make connections from the volleyball court to the weight room sessions, helping the athletes as well as the coaches better understand the connection between the physical preparation and the sporting outcomes.